Okay, so today we have Dr. Sama from Sparta Global. Dr. Sama is a cybersecurity development security operations trainer at Sparta Global. Um, he did his PhD, um, and after his PhD, he did four postdocs uh, at Orange Telecom, University of Westminster, and University of Kent. Um, he worked in many domains in computer science. Uh, such as networking, IT devices, cloud computing, um, development operations, uh, and cybersecurity. Uh, and he also worked as a network solution engineer, network lab instructor, IT manager, R&D manager, uh, and research associate uh, and cybersecurity trainer. Today, he's gonna to be talking about uh, DevSec operation. He's gonna explain what that is. Uh, concept and challenges. Um, so Dr. Sama, if you're ready, please start. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will start by sharing my screen. So, share. Okay, could you please let me know that if you can see the screen? Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Osama Abon, and today we will talk about DevSecOps. Why do we need DevSecOps and what does that mean? Uh, I'm cybersecurity and DevSecOps trainer at Sparta Global. So let's start by, I will start with just an idea what's Sparta, okay? Sparta Global is one of the leading provider of technology and business consulting, uh, consulting services. We work with over 100 organizations in the UK. Uh, we work with the private sector and with the government, uh, just like, for example, uh, the Home Office uh, and many other government uh, agencies. We provide them with our consultants to work on their projects. So the main idea here that uh, in the Spartans, uh, we have the opportunities. Uh, we can say that we have the software development, software testing, data engineering, business analysis, DevOps, and the cybersecurity DevSecOps. These are the streams that we grad we uh, we train the consultants to work with. Okay, so just one idea, one thing, how we work, the business model that we use. So we, if you want, for example, if a graduate, a fresh graduate want to work with us, so they would apply to the, an opportunity, for example, in one of these domains. And then if they manage to secure a spot with a, one of our courses and other stream, they we would start with, we will start with a training five to eight weeks. And in this eight we, five to eight weeks, they will have intensive training on the, on the tools and the technologies that they will be working with. After that, they will have two months for interviews with the clients, and then they would start with contracts up to two years uh, with one of our clients. So one of the domains that we cover is DevSecOps. So what is, what is DevSecOps? DevSecOps, basically, it's the merge between two domains, DevOps and cybersecurity. So when we put DevOps and cybersecurity together, we have DevSecOps. But then we have the same question, what is DevOps? Okay, we know what is cybersecurity, but what is DevOps and why do we need DevOps? In order to understand why do we need DevOps, let's check out the software development methodology that we having in the market or we're having in the business we had yesterday and we having today. So in the 80s and the 90s, we had something called the waterfall, waterfall methodology for the software development. And thus, in a nutshell, this waterfall methodology, if you want, let's say that we want to develop a software. And then whenever we want to develop the software, we will try to collect the requirements for the whole software. After that, we start by designing the software. So we need to finish the design, the whole design upfront, everything, okay? After that, we start with the implementation, then the testing, then 
the operation and the maintenance for the project in which that's going to be at the end of the project and then we deliver the project to the client or the customer this methodology proved to be non-efficient why because for the for the big projects somehow it's impossible to cover all the requirements that you will have from the beginning okay so while you are just like cover, uh, trying to uh, collect all the requirements and then you start the design you will have that you will have the idea that okay i forgot this about the requirements so i should uh, add it later so we should add 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 and we keep just like spending a lot of time on the requirements and design when we get to the implementation this is another issue because the implementation will discover that there are many other requirements that should have been added so in the 80s and the 90s Many projects, a huge amount of projects failed to deliver because of this methodology. Okay. And the time was a, an issue because since you're having these issues, you will not be able to say that, okay, I will just spend six months, for example, to deliver the projects. So mostly we were just like in the 80s and the 90s, we were just saying that, okay, it's six months. Let's say that it's going to be nine months. Okay. So the time, the duration of the project was not really something that you can anticipate accurately. Then, then we had, they, we moved from the waterfall to something called the agile methodology. In the agile methodology, we, we, we said that, okay, we will work differently now. We will not do the whole requirements and the whole design, everything upfront. We will just try to break these projects into multiple uh, phases or multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, small smaller units, and then every time we will try to do or to create one of these units. Okay, so we will go from the design, from the planning, for the defining, the design, testing, the deploy. So we finish the first unit. So that's going to be much easier. So, and then we can deliver this unit to the customer directly. So in this case, we deliver, we, instead of delivering the whole project after one year, for example, here in the agile methodology, we have continuous delivery. So whenever, let's say that I'm um, just like, uh, we are trying to uh, develop uh, e-commerce website so we start for example by let's create the user registration and then we deliver the user registration to the customer so the customer can check whether they are happy with that or not and then we do the purchase and 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 so everything is going to be more uh, we will do more delivery but that means we have much more uh, stages and phases to go through okay so now we work in the agile methodology so what's the, why do we need this and what was the what was the issue with this that led us to devops let's move on to devops why devops also in the past since the development team used just like to sit and keep developing the code and going for planning coding building testing until the code is ready they would just like take the code when they are finished and they will send the code to the operation teams. One of the things that was happening a lot, that operation team will take the code, will start, will try to work with the code uh, to put it on the server, for example, to deploy it on the servers, and it's not going to work. Why? Because the environments are different, okay? So they will go back to the development team your app is not working your code is not working the development team no it's working on my computer okay so that was an issue a big issue because the development team and the operation team they were isolated totally isolated from each other they just the development team would just like send the code to the operation team and ask them to deploy it okay so now why why agile change this too because in the waterfall methodology we had to do the deployment once or twice, for example, right? But when we move to the agile methodology where we do doing deployment, for example, every two weeks or every month, that was a new issue in here because 
this confusion and this miscommunication was just like repeated every two weeks or every week or every month okay not just like once or twice in the long uh, on the on the time of uh, on the lifetime of the project so then they decided that why don't we why don't we create something in the middle between the development okay between the development team and the operation team in which it would just have then the knowledge of both teams in order to be the bridge between them so here we got something called the devops okay so the devops is the merge between some of the development uh, the development skills and some of the operation skills and they can do both of them okay so this is how we got to devops now you're asking yourself so what is the problem with the cybersecurity? now we uh, we were talking about what's the issue here. So let's go through the, through the definition of DevOps. So basically DevOps as academic, okay? They said that is a set of practices. So which means we have multiple, multiple, uh, many, uh, many ways and many methods to do one thing in which the main idea is to move the changes from the development to the production. Okay, we need to do this in a shorter time and we need to do this in a higher quality. And now you can imagine that this environment is not really a stable environment. It's not an environment that you would set up the environment and leave it and it's working for six months. It's changing every day. And whenever we have something changing every day or every week or every uh, month, we have security risks. Right, so new vulnerabilities, new risks, and new uh, exploits might just like arise. New vulnerabilities might uh, might arise from time to time. Okay. Now, in the practical definition, uh, DevOps basically it's a collaboration, a culture, a practice, and approach to work between the development and the operations. Okay. Here we have a lot of, uh, we have here what we call the, sci the life cycle of DevOps in which we start by the planning, coding, building, testing, releasing, deploy, operate, and monitor. And all these tools and much more than these tools are used in this process, okay? Now, if you notice here, something is missing, the security. Nobody thought about the security here, okay? So the security was not part of this process. The security basically, okay, since we have something called continuous development, continuous integration, continuous delivery and deployment, and continuous monitoring, but we don't have anything about security, okay? Before DevSecOps, the cybersecurity was not really involved in the DevOps. Okay, so if we just like take this as a flat from the planning to the monitor, security was just like integrated at the end. When you finish the planning, coding, building, testing, you want to release the software or this unit, then you start thinking about security. Okay, let's think about security, how to do, how to make this secure. Even in some projects, Security was added only for auditing purposes, okay? Because someone would do the audit, have you done security or not? Not because they want to secure it, because they had to secure it only, okay? For, uh, for, uh, for legal or laws issues. So security was not really part of this. So security was just like the icing on the cake, okay? So at the end, when you finish, let's add some security. With DevSecop, the new approach that and with the approach that moving left moving security left they we say that security should start from the beginning and DevSecOps, this is what we do we start by thinking about security from the planning myth, from the planning phase when we start thinking about the project we need to start thinking that how to design this software in order to be 400 percent secure Okay, so the whole, the main idea of the design should be secure. And then 
we start by learn by teaching the developers how to write secure code okay so it's not don't wait until the end to find out that this code was not secure no you should start from the beginning and then in the building testing release so security basically is not a phase in DevSecop, but it's a part of each phase of devops okay so here we have dev development security and operations all together now in cyber security okay so in cyber security we have what we call the macomber cube so now let's see why this is going to be why the cyber security cube is important here and difficult this is the main thing that should be applied so we try the the cyber security cube the macomber cube is a framework a model framework okay to establish and evaluate whether we have a, the correct security or not in our projects we cover three dimensions in the macomber cube we cover the desired goals which consist of the confidentiality integrity and availability we cover the data states which means that whenever we are working with a project now you would be surprised by the uh, by how many enterprise they have security only in the transmission so they secure the data only when they move the data from a place to another uh, place for example from between the client and the server but the data itself it's stored in a clear text without any protection on the servers so anybody can if the a hacker managed to get access to the network then the storage is not encrypted so they can get access to everything in the data okay so that's why we try to focus on the data states for example and in the desired goal data states and the data should be encrypted all the time whether it's transmitted whether it's stored or whether it's in processing when you process the data you should also try to find out whether it's secure or not and we cover the third thing in the DevSecOps and with the cybersecurity cube which is the human factors okay and you know social engineering and reverse uh, reverse engineering and uh, the uh, the social engineering is one the human factor is one of the main issues in cybersecurity okay if you have the best system but you don't have a trained staff that's uh, you will uh, you will have any security issues and then we have the policies and the practices in which we say that it's not that you only have the human factor. You should have the human factor, but also you need to give the human factor, the human, uh, the employees or the staff or the users, the policies and the practices that they should follow in order to be secured, okay? In order to be protected and the third thing is to give them the technology so if they need encryption for example cryptography they need libraries they need certain tools to secure the work they should have these tools so here we cover that's why we cover a lot about the cybersecurity cube the desired goals the data states and the safeguards and it's a, a, it's an important part in dev secop now one of the other thing that we use a lot in DevSecOps is penetration testing. And penetration testing, here we have, penetration testing basically is the method to gain uh, the assurance that the security of your IT system is good. How to do that? by attempting to breach some of your some of all or all of your user security okay how to use this same tools and techniques that would be used by your adversary or your hacker so in this case in the bin testing you take your software you put it on an environment 
and you try to be the hacker. Okay, so you will try to breach or to hack your system using the same tools and the techniques that might be by might be used by your adversary. So this is just like to find out whether you're secure or not. So this is basically the penetration testing. Penetration testing is not is not only one thing. Penetration testing is multiple things. For for example, we have uh physical penetration testing we have network penetration testing we have software penetration testing cloud penetration testing we have a lot of subdomains in the penetration testing we have social engineering penetration testing so we will not go into the details of penetration testing but i will show you an example of the penetration testing the social engineering of penetration Testing. So this is a video that has been, this is a real attempt that has been done with one of the reviewers on, Def, uh, on DEFCON. Okay, uh, let me know just if you hear the sound. Can you hear the sound? DEFCON is the biggest yes. hacker convention of the year. It's place where thousands of hackers come to hear talks to demonstrate their newest hacks. It's actually a place that's so dangerous to, to be on the internet that they tell you to turn off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth on your phone, and they tell you not to use the ATMs too because those could be hacked as well. This is the DEF CON ballroom. It's sort of the main room where things are happening, and it's pretty wild. I think this is Car Hacking Village. This car is locked. Can you get me in? I'll unlock it for you. It should be good. <laughs> Hacking is no longer like this fringe activity. And if you are at DEF CON, there's a good chance that you're here because you want to learn what could happen to you or your company. Anyone here first time in the SCCTF? Holy crap. I invited Chris to hack me uh, with his team, um, but they're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. We help people with human security issues by testing vulnerabilities for, um, for like a network test, but it's for the people network. We test those vulnerabilities, see where the holes are, and then help people learn so they can patch them. Can we try some of this? Can we try some, Yeah. see I if think, it works? Yeah, we, we probably could uh, have our star visher here make some phone calls as <laughs> Let's do it. Sure, do you want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation, and basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I My baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my... <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I... So I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Okay, my Jessica name is... uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She no even gets the support daughter. person to change my Thank password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just no, basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. I really thought that my cell phone company would protect me. I mean, like, this is the most basic stuff, and and they're not doing it. And if they're not doing it, you know, all these other businesses aren't doing it either. Anyone with a phone and an internet connection can do social engineering. 
But I was curious, what can a hacker with serious coding skills do? Well, DEF CON is the world's biggest hacking convention. It's hacking everything, hacking uh, social, hacking hardware, hacking software, hacking various systems. I asked Dan Tentler, a well-known security researcher, to turn all of his firepower on me. I did get into quite a number of things that I found. So what were the first things you did? How did you start hacking me? Uh, I quickly found your Squarespace blog and had an idea. Uh, basically what I did was created a bogus Squarespace site and sent an email to you, um, a fish asking you to go to this website, run this certificate installer. And I did it, because yeah. I'm an idiot. So once you ran that, uh, it gave me access to your computer and I created several fake pop-ups that looked like system pop-ups uh, that would ask you for your credentials. You didn't even have to have my passwords. No, you gave them to me. I gave them to you. Yeah. So I, I stole your 1Password keychain. That's and 1Password is where I store all my other passwords. So effectively by... And your social security number and your Amex stuff and all your stock trading and bank information. I can send email to everyone in this room as you. I am you right now if I wanted to be. If my evilness is working correctly, it should actually be taking pictures of your desktop and pictures through your webcam every two minutes. And I have been watching you for about two days now. In oh coffee shops, at your mom's house, on a plane. Here's your editing stuff, there's you like Oh my god, so nervous. this is literally... Every two minutes. Through my webcam. Yeah, through this guy. How badly could you have messed up my life? I could have made you homeless. I could have made you homeless and penniless. How, I, how, how would you make me homeless? Like I have control of your, your digital life in its entirety. I have all your credentials, I have all your access to all your financial information, all your work information, all your personal information. I can pay people with your bank account or your Amex account. I am you. I can fully impersonate. Like, the only thing I couldn't doctor would be like your fingerprints. This is like as bad as it gets. It's ridiculous, yeah, it's bad. So it turns out that Dan Tentler is very good at his job. I mean, he hacked the hell out of me. He got everything. Well, I mean, frankly, I want to take my computer and throw it into the deepest part of the ocean, and I want to become a hermit, and I want to never touch a piece of technology again, because, holy shit, that was, that was everything. That was the keys to my entire life, and he just, he just pulled them out of his pocket. So... So this is, that was one example of the, how to use penetration testing. And that was the social engineering penetration testing, which means that you have your software is a hundred percent protected, but your staff or the users are not really, really aware of the dangers that they can have by just like one click or by uh, responding to, to their phone. So that's why we, when we start with DevSecOps, we also work not only to, to do the pen testing in order to test our software, we use something called the threat modeling. In the threat modeling, we try to identify the threats in the organization, in the target network, in an application while we are working on them. So we can just like try to map all these threats to find out where are our vulnerabilities or where, where is the place that we are the most vulnerable for, okay? So we use, in the DevSecOps, we use threat modeling and pen testing together. So in the pen testing, we use the modeling, the mapping out. We use the, uh, the threats from the threat modeling to find out whether they were mitigated or not. And we try to inform any type of activities, okay? And we try to inform what are the discovered vulnerabilities in this case, okay? So in threat modeling, we start from the beginning to map out all the threats. And then whenever we have something to test, we do the pen testing in order to find out whether we are protected or not, okay? Now, uh, after finishing the penetration testing, okay, we try to apply the countermeasures. So you will have a report that, okay, we found many vulnerabilities and you should do this or that, okay? So we give also the steps how to mitigate these things. In threat modeling, we try to, to answer these questions. 
where am I most vulnerable to attack? Okay, so you try to go through everything in your infrastructure or your software. And then what are the most relevant threats to my, to my system? And what do I need to do to safeguard against these threats? Okay, so the steps that can protect, protect me. The last thing that we try to work with is not only the last, this is the main, one of the last main things that we try to do is the incident response. So in DevSecOps also, we try to do the incident response in which in the incident response, we try to build a structured methodology. This methodology is basically meant to handle the security incidents. So, and the breaches and the cyber threats. So basically what we say that in a secure software, you should try, by, you should start by the threat modeling. You should model all the threats. You should study all of these things. When you have your software or any part of it, you should try to do the pen testing for this software to find out whether it's vulnerable or not. Regardless of the result, whether you are secure or not, even if you are 100% secure, you should have an incident response plan. So in case some hackers manage to find a new vulnerability or anything, you should have a plan how to mitigate these incidents. So an incident response plan, basically the IRB, will allow you to effectively effectively identify and minimize the damage. So you will not, if there is just like a DDoS attack, so you will not just like try having the, your employees or the staff just going around trying to think, what should we do? They should have a written plan telling them what they should do step by step, okay? And that would reduce the cost of the cyber attack because you have a plan and just like for the worst case scenario. Okay, and in this case, you need to find, uh, you can, uh, in the plan, you find and you fix the cause that prevented, uh, and to, uh, the co uh, you try to, to fix the cause and to prevent any future attack. Okay, so for example, some of the plans that we have in incident response, we try, when we work with DevSecOps, we try to create them we can say that, okay, if I have an issue with malicious code, what I should have a plan. If I have a DOS attack, denial of service, I should have attack. If I figured out that there is a phishing attack against my software or against my system. So in this case too, I should have an, a plan. So all these things should have different plans because the mitigation and the prevention is not exactly the same for all of these things. So your blue team, your security team should not be, should not wonder what to do when they have any of these issues, okay? Finally, we have Microsoft DevSecOps tips. Microsoft gave some of the tips for DevSecOps. It start by, you should build a security first culture across the business. So the culture of let's just get something out without thinking about the security should not be adopted anymore. Security first culture is what you need to go with. Then you need to integrate security in the early stages of the development cycle. As we saw that we need to move left with cybersecurity to start from the planning. One of the things that for Microsoft, uh, monitoring and observing the uh, continuously is one of the main thing, you should have a continuous monitoring for everything in order to find out if there is any anomaly in your system. And number four, Microsoft said that you should embrace everything as code. Anything that you can write code for, just write the code. Because in this case, you minimize the possibility for any human error because you already have the code. So 
everything is a code. If you want to create a server, you can create a code, you can write the code, you can write a script, just write the script. If you can, anything you can do it with a code, do it with a code. Because you will write the code, you will test the code once, and then you will keep using the code all the time. Now, realize compliance with police, uh, policy uh, automation, and then you should secure and visualize your software supply chain. So for example, if your software depends on other libraries, okay, your responsibility is not only your software. You should also keep an eye on the other libraries that you use in your software. So the supply chain is your, uh, the supply chain is your, uh, basically is your uh, responsibility. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's in a nutshell, what is DevSecOps and the main, uh, the main idea about DevSecOps. Okay. Thanks for listening. And if you have any question, please, you can ask it now. Thank you very much, Dr. Summer, for your interesting talk. Um, any question from the audience, please? Uh, yes, can I ask a question, uh, Osama? Yeah. So uh, you say that we should involve the security from the first, I mean, from the starting phase of development. Yeah. But how much, I mean, how about the cost? Because it's, it's very costly to involve the security from the, the very early stage of development. Yeah, that's correct. It's going to be um, uh, cost uh, costly and you will spend more time, but mm -hmm. it's going to be much uh, cheaper than having a, a security breach in the future, because when you launch you when you launch the business, okay, and then there is a data breach. You have for first of all, the business will lose the reputation. Second, especially now with the GDPR with other laws, you have a lot of fine.